Hey everyone, as a bit of fun, I thought I'd share with you the first part of my Patreon exclusive series. What if Ash used his old Pokemon? This story has been a lot of fun to cover, and if you'd like to see the rest of it, as well as gain early access to all my content, you can do so by supporting me on Patreon. Patreon goes a long way in helping me pursue my goal of one day becoming a full-time content creator, so please consider becoming a patron today. And if you haven't done so already, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. But enough shameless begging. Let's begin the story. Our story begins in Pallet Town, the morning after Ash has returned from the Jodo region, having just placed in the top eight of the Silver Conference. He and Pikachu are seated in the dining room of their home, enjoying a hearty breakfast, when Ash's mother Delia joins them, telling them that Gary is also in town, having arrived just a few days before Ash. Excited at the thought of seeing his rival and now friend once more, our young hero springs to his feet, thanking his mum for the tip, and sprinting to Professor Oak's lab with Pikachu at his heels. When he arrives, the professor is there to greet him, intuitively asking if he is here to see Gary. With a nod, Ash says that he is, causing Oak to reply that he just missed him. This is all Ash needs to hear running off just as quickly as he arrived, and in so doing causing the divergence point in the timeline, as Oak is unable to tell Ash about Gary's plan to start again with just Blastoise, thus putting the idea into the boy's head. On the outskirts of Pallet, Ash is at last able to catch up with Gary, with the young Oak asking if Ash has come to see him off. Ash smiles that he has, and the pair shake hands, with Ash wishing his rival luck in his journey, while Gary in turn imparts some advice to Ash, that he should use this time between journeys to think about what he really wants. The pair then part ways, with Ash and Pikachu finding a large tree to sit in, looking out over Pallet Town and the Greater Kanto region. Quietly, Ash confesses to Pikachu that he's uncomfortable with that Brock and Misty at his side after so long. Long, but the little electric rodent is there to give his trainer comfort, and this gives Ash heart, just as the sight of Ho-Oh flying overhead does a moment later. Watching it go, Ash states that it must be heading to the faraway Hoenn region, declaring that he will go there too, since there are so many new battles to be had and new Pokemon to meet. However, before he can do any such thing, he must continue an old battle with a trio of familiar faces, Team Rocket. In their usual devious way, the trio have laid a pit trap for Ash, and with villainous glee they recite their motto, as well as announce their intentions to steal Pikachu. Thankfully before they parted, Brock and Misty gave Ash just the tools he needs to escape this trap, and so with a declaration of thanks to his friends, Ash bursts forth, having Pikachu use a thunderbolt and sending the crooks blasting off again. From here the rest of the day is spent in preparation, with Ash having Professor Oak check that his Pokemon are a fit state to undertake a new journey. Oak is happy to give his seal of approval, as well as a new Pokédex, carrying information on all the Pokémon of Hoenn, and so Ash rallies his team of six from his most recent journey, those being Pikachu, Bayleaf, Totodile, Cyndaquil, Heracross, and Fanpy. The next morning, after bidding goodbye to his mother and receiving his first change of clothes since beginning his journey, Ash sets off for Hoenn. Catching a cruise ship from Seafoam Island, Ash and his Pokémon enjoy their time on board, with them spending the majority of the first day playing in the pool. That is aside from Cyndaquil and Fanpy, who instead stretch out and have a nice relaxing nap on a deck chair. However, their trip is not all fun and games, as that evening when everyone is asleep, Team Rocket rear their ugly heads once more, breaking into Ash's cabin and attempting to steal Pikachu. In this they are only half successful, as while they do manage to nab the electric type, they wake Ash in the process, causing him to give chase, albeit while half asleep. This is to the villain's advantage as they are able to lose their pursuer without much trouble, though Ash is not about to give up on his best buddy, and so bringing out his remaining Pokemon, tells them to split up and find Pikachu while he gets help from the ship's captain. Luckily the captain is a kind man, and is more than willing to help Ash look, using the ship's internal systems to locate the trio of criminals and their prisoner in the food storage. Thanking the captain, Ash reconvenes with his Pokemon, and together they corner the Team Rocket trio. As they always do, Jesse and James attempt to put up a fight, but with Bayleaf at hand, Ash is able to make short work of Arbok and Weezing, sending Team Rocket blasting off for the second time in as many days. Thanks to Ash's efficient handling of the thieves, the ship isn't damaged in any way, allowing it to dock on schedule, and thus putting Ash and Hoenn a whole day earlier than in canon. As a result, when he arrives at Professor Birch's lab, the Professor is able to greet him, welcoming the boy to Hoenn, and showing him the three starters of the region, Torchic, Trico, and Mudkip. Though Ash does still mistake Trico for a water type, he makes an overall good impression on the Professor, with the man inviting him to stay the night. Graciously, Ash accepts, and so he and his Pokémon spend a comfortable night at Birch's lab, leaving first thing in the morning, and without knowing it, narrowly missing a girl who is on her way to the lab to receive her starter. 
With no companion to slow him down, Ash and Pikachu race to Aldale Town, where they stop off briefly so that Ash can register for the Hoenn League. However, due to all his Pokemon being in top shape, there is no need to stay any longer, and with the allure of a new gym just around the corner, Ash eagerly begins down the road to Petalburg City. On foot it takes another two days, but Ash manages to reach Petalburg without any hassle, and in what can only be called an Ash move, zeroes in on the gym as soon as he steps foot in the city. To his surprise, the Petalburg gym more closely resembles a house than a usual battle facility, but all the same, Ash barges in, eager to win his first Hoenn badge. And this is not the only surprise the young son of Pallet receives, as what awaits him inside is a boy of about seven years old who points and yells when he spots him. Taken aback, Ash is rooted to the spot as this child exclaims that he recognized him from the Silver Conference. He's that second round washout, Alf! A little testily, Ash retorts that he made to the second round of the Victory Tournament, and that his name is Ash. But the child couldn't care less, saying he could have done better if he'd had the chance. Now definitely annoyed, Ash demands to know who this squad is, with the boy replying that he is Max, the Petalburg City Gym Leader. This at last is some good news, with Ash demanding he be given a battle, a challenge which Max happily accepts, saying they will have a 3v3. The pair then make their way to the battlefield, with Ash readying a Pokeball in his hand. However, but before they can begin, a woman's voice asks if Max is pretending to be the gym leader again, a slight scolding edge to her tone that suggests this is not the first time this has happened. A little petulantly, Max protests that it's just some early round league reject, so it's not like he's worth Dad's time, but the woman reminds him that is not his decision, and besides, the boy doesn't have any Pokemon. This causes Ash to face fall, as the woman at last addresses him, apologizing for her son's misbehavior and introducing herself as Caroline, wife of the real gym leader Norman. At the sound of his name, a dark-haired man enters, who Ash surmises is Norman, and upon hearing that his son has promised Ash a gym battle, offers to make good on the promise if Ash is interested. Ash grins that he sure is, and so the battle begins on the terms Max set. Norman as the gym leader chooses first, bringing out his Slackoth, while Ash picks Fampy as his first Pokemon. With a happy cry, the baby elephant takes to the field, and on Ash's command, curls into a ball, first using Defense Curl, then bursting forth with Rollout. Across from them, Norman praises the ground type speed, though he admits sometimes going too fast can be a bad thing. A point he proves by the lazy manner in which his Slackoth easily dodges the first pass of Rollout. He then has it repeat the action four more times, with each slight swaying motion stymieing Ash and his Pokemon alike. It is only when Fampy stops to catch its breath after five successive failures that Slackoth goes in the attack, with a super effective blizzard that hits the blue elephant head on, knocking it back and sending it crashing into the ground with a thud. This gives Ash an idea, with him having Fampy use Earthquake, since Slackoth's swaying can't protect it from ground attacks. In this, Ash is quite right, as with a stamp of its tiny foot, Fampy sends violent vibrations coursing through the ground, which knock Slackoth off its feet and leave it vulnerable to a follow-up attack. Seizing this opportunity, Ash orders a takedown, and as the baby elephant bounds forward, it slams into the prone Slackoth, driving it into a wall and clinching the first victory for Ash. Joyfully, Fampy runs back to its trainer, with Ash giving the ground type a hug, while Pikachu gives it a playful shock which it enjoys thanks to its immunity to electric moves. However, the match is far from over, as Norman's next Pokemon is Vigoroth, and despite having taken a super effective hit not too long ago, Fampy still wants to battle, so Ash allows it to return to the field. At once, Ash tries his Earthquake trick again, but Norman is far too skilled to fall for the same trap twice, having Vigoroth use its powerful legs to leap into the air and latch onto the ceiling with his bladed claws. With surprising speed the normal type obeys, avoiding the hit entirely and securing itself a perch out of harm's way. However, in doing so it ties up its hands while also being out of range of a counterattack. Or so Ash thinks. On Norman's command, Vigoroth belches a mighty flamethrower down at Fanpy. And though Ash cries for a defense curl, even this boost in resilience is not enough to keep the baby Pokemon standing when it's bathed in flames, resulting in the score being evened at one victory apiece. Wanting to avenge his little buddy, Pikachu barks up at Ash, requesting to battle next, an idea which Ash has no complaint with, telling his partner to do his thing. And so it is that Pikachu begins round two, leaping into battle and firing a Thunderbolt up at Vigoroth. However, on Norman's cry, the speedy ape dodges, dropping back down to the ground and swiping at Pikachu with a scratch attack. This does some nasty damage, but the little electric type isn't ready to give up yet, readying a quick attack which strikes Vigoroth center mass. Vigoroth next attempts a point-blank flamethrower, but Ash has Pikachu match this with a thunderbolt, and as the two attacks meet in the middle, they cancel each other out, creating a shockwave that throws both Pokemon back. Thankfully, neither is downed by this, with Pikachu and Vigoroth both crying their names as they run back into the center of the field, meeting with a head-on collision of quick attack and brick break that once more ends in a stalemate. 
This fast-paced and frenetic battle has only lasted a matter of moments, yet both Pikachu and Vigoroth look exhausted as they break apart. Concern in his voice, Ash asks if Pikachu's alright, but the electric rodent just flashes his cheeks, symbolising his readiness to see this fight out to the bitter end. Vigoroth, it seems, is just as willing, pounding its chest and snarling at Pikachu to hit it with its best shot. Pikachu has no objection to this, and so channeling the sparking lightning from his cheeks launches a full power thunderbolt that cracks the floor beneath it as it races towards Vigoroth. The wild monkey Pokemon then responds in kind, marshalling the last of its strength for a blazing flamethrower that dwarfs its previous attempt. Once more these pair of attacks meet, though this time it is not a simple dissipation. Instead a tug of war ensues, with both Pikachu and Vigoroth having to pump more and more power into their attack in an attempt to overwhelm the other. This quickly builds an immense amount of pressure, and with nowhere to go, it does the only thing it can, rocking the entire gym with an explosion that bathes the battlefield in black smoke. Coughing and panting, Ash and Norman wave the fumes away as they call out for their partners, though when the smoke truly clears, what they find is both Pikachu and Vigoroth lying unconscious, thus rendering this duel a draw. With the final battle now at hand, Ash and Norman choose their last Pokemon at the same time, slacking for Norman and Heracross for Ash. Though this is a favourable type matchup for the challenger, he is not so arrogant as to discount the King Ape's clear power, which is etched in every line of its immense body. Due to Norman's versatile battling style, Ash has no way of knowing how slacking will fight, and so figuring that proactivity is his best bet, he elects to go with an old faithful, having Heracross use Mega Horn. Taking to the air on buzzing wings, Heracross flies at slacking, its horn glowing. However, this is met by a counter, as Norman has slacking catch Heracross with its large hands and hurl the bug to the floor. This does more than tickle, with Heracross howling in pain, but oddly enough, slacking doesn't press the advantage. Instead, it seems to be slacking off. Ash doesn't understand this behaviour, but he's not about to look a gift ponytail in the mouth, and so as Heracross retreat back to his side of the field, it is only when the fighting bug has done so that Slacking seems to focus up again, charging a hyper beam at Norman's command. Knowing how devastating the consequences of this landing would be, Ash's Heracross fly up to dodge the beam, before having it follow up with a mega horn. Like before, Slacking has seemingly allowed its mind to wander, and so this hits unabated, doing sizable damage as Heracross's impressive physical strength allows it to send the simian skidding back a little. Unfortunately, this still leaves Heracross in the danger zone, as with its focus now returned, Slacking leaps forward, smashing into the bug with a double edge that does tremendous damage, leaving Heracross in a bad position. However, once more, Slacking doesn't follow up, instead scratching its behind and looking out the window. And this is all the confirmation Ash needs. For all its power, Slacking has a glaring weakness. Grinning, Ash has Heracross fall back and charge up a Focus Punch. A risky play, but one Heracross is willing to enact due to its faith in Ash. As Ash suspected, Slacking is unable to put a stop to this, and so as soon as its Focus returns, it is met by a supercharged punch to the jaw. Knowing that this is the most dangerous part of his plan, Ash wastes no time having Heracross retreat, and this is a wise decision, as Slacking attempts another double edge, with Heracross only narrowly avoiding the blow. Then like before, Slacking stops dead, with Ash smiling that his strategy is working, before having Heracross charge up another focus punch. This works just as effectively as the first time, with Ash once again having Heracross retreat from Slacking's follow-up attack, this time a hyper beam, before resuming the process of charging up another focus punch, now that it can afford to make itself vulnerable. Being a smart man, Norman has clocked this strategy, and knowing that he cannot stop Heracross from capitalizing on Slacking's true ability, he does the next best thing, commanding Slacking to use Double Edge as soon as it is able. This poses a distinct threat to Ash, as Heracross has already begun its assault, and with Norman now having a counter in place, they won't be able to rely on their hit and run gambit moving forward. Weighing his options, Ash decides the best course of action is to follow through, and so with a cry tells Heracross to keep going. Having reached the same conclusion as Ash, Heracross presses the attack driving its glowing fist into Slacking's face just as the lazy Pokemon shoulder barges it. Both moves are clearly powerful, and as the pair of Pokemon skid past each other, both are panting, with all involved knowing that this match will be decided by who falls first. Then, Heracross winces, appearing to fall forward, however at the last second it catches itself, a feat that Slacking cannot match as its heavy frame collapses, ending the battle and earning Ash the balance badge. Recalling their Pokemon, 
Ash and Norman meet in the centre of the ring to shake hands, with the gym leader commending the Cantonian boy in a well-fought battle before handing him both his badge and a badge case to store it in. Smiling, Ash thanks Norman, saying he'll never forget his very first battle in the Hoenn region. Then with Pikachu on his shoulder, he heads off for the Pokemon Center to give his friends a rest. As he waits for his Pokemon to heal, Ash decides to give Professor Oak a call, who is delighted to hear from him, and even more impressed when Ash tells him about his win over Norman. As this story comes to an end, Pikachu, Fanpy, and Heracross are brought out to the boy, with Nurse Joy smiling that his Pokemon are all in perfect health, with Heracross even being lively enough to attempt to eat the sap out of her bonsai tree. Chuckling, Oak says he suspects Heracross misses the trees around the lab as well as Ash's Bulbasaur, with the boy agreeing and asking if Oak would mind him sending Heracross back to him. The professor smiles that that would be no problem at all, and so as Ash thanks the bug for its efforts against Norman, he places its ball on the transfer machine. When Oak is Heracross, he asks if Ash would like to substitute in any of his other Pokemon, but to his surprise, Ash shakes his head, saying he thinks the five he has are enough, since now he has room to bring along any new friend he makes here in Hoenn. Smiling, Oak says he quite understands, and so after a brief goodbye, hangs up the phone, allowing Ash to head over to the center's dining hall. Here he encounters a familiar but unexpected person, Brock, albeit in a very expected position, professing his love to Nurse Joy. Walking over to his friend, Ash greets the older boy, asking what he's doing here, and this is enough to snap Brock out of his reverie, with him beaming that he came to Hoenn to travel with Ash again, if he'll have him. Ash grins that he wouldn't have it any other way, and with matching smiles the pair clasp hands. The next morning, Ash and Brock head into Petalburg Forest, though with Brock's navigational skill and tendency to be prepared, they not only have enough food to keep their spirits high, but also avoid crossing into Talo territory, thus giving them an unencumbered first leg of their journey. The same cannot be said for Team Rocket though, who after finding their way to Hoenn, have been hot on Ash's trail. However, being a trio of doofuses, they do have the misfortune of drawing the ire of a particularly territorial Talo flock, who steal all their food while leaving them with a number of nasty peck wounds. And this isn't even the worst thing the trio encounter in the forest, with Jesse, James, and Meowth soon stumbling upon a poacher who has kidnapped a large group of Ekans and coughing. In a moment of uncharacteristic decency, the trio of thieves rescue the captured Pokemon, though it does mean saying goodbye to their own Arbok and Weezing, who were needed to protect their new friends from being abducted once again. However, when Arceus closes a door, he opens a window. As before the day is up, James has made himself a new friend, a cuddly Cacnea whose hugs cause the blue-haired man immense pain, even if they do secretly warm his heart. A few days later, the dastardly trio finally manage to catch up to Ash, stumbling upon him and his twerpy friend while the boy is battling it out with an angsty Trico, who refuses to leave its tree home, despite the tree being on the verge of death. This touches James and Meowth, though Jesse calls this sentimentality idiotic, and so prepares a plan to force Trico to leave its tree by sending it to the boss. Meanwhile, Ash has much more altruistic intentions, having Pikachu and Totodile help Trico water and nurture the ailing tree late into the night, with this simple act of kindness earning the friendship of the little wood gecko. Unfortunately, their ministrations are cut short by the arrival of Team Rocket, who in their usual malicious manner attempt to steal not only all the Trico who live in the tree, but also Pikachu. Thankfully, Totodile is still at hand, and with its powerful water gun is able to send Team Rocket blasting off before they can do any serious damage. Unfortunately, saving Trico's home is not so easy, with the big tree finally collapsing at sunrise and leaving Ash's new friend with nowhere to go. That is until Ash offers the grass type a place on his team, and off which Trico is happy to accept, securing its spot as Ash's first Hoenn capture. However, everything is not peachy among the team, as when Ash and Brock stop for lunch later that day, the rest of Ash's Pokemon meet Trico for the first time, including one very possessive and jealous Bayleaf. By now she has made peace with the fact that Ash will give attention to other Pokemon, but another grass starter? And one who is newer and shinier than her? That is another matter altogether, with feelings of anxiety at being replaced filling the dinosaur. These quickly curdle into resentment, and when Trico has the audacity to not even show her beloved Ash the proper respect of eating the lunch she prepared for it? This is just the pretext Bayleaf needs, barking angrily at her fellow grass type. For its part, Trico dismisses this loud yapping with a turn of its head, and this really angers Bayleaf, who holds a series of razor leaves at his counterpart. In response, Trico merely bats these away with its thick tail, and while Bayleaf wants to do more, a call from Ash stops her. However, even if the battle has been averted for now, a one-sided rivalry has been born, the consequences of which will be far-reaching. 
From here, there aren't many significant changes from canon for the rest of Ash and Brock's time in Petalburg Forest, with Ash still defeating Anthony's unofficial gym, and Brock still becoming the trainer of a rather quirky Lotad. The largest change from canon is that without May in their party, there is no reason to stop at Rustboro Hall for the Pokemon contest, meaning that Ash and Brock reach Rustboro a little earlier, though at the cost of Pikachu not learning Iron Tail. Upon arriving, Ash's first stop after visiting the Pokemon Center is the gym, and as fortune would have it, Roxanne is available to face him, stepping into a rock-themed gym, Roxanne explains that her battle is a 2v2, reminding both Ash and Brock of their gym battle so long ago. Nonetheless, Ash accepts the challenge, opening with Trico, while the gym leader chooses her Geodude. At once, Ash goes on the attack, having Trico rush in, but this is met by Geodude's powerful hands, blocking the attack just like Slacking did in Ash's battle with Norman. However, even if it has only been a fortnight, Ash has grown since then, refining his battle style, and so prepares a counter by having Trico use Geodude's strength against it, by holding tight to the Rock-type's hands, and making them the springboard to somersault over Geodude, delivering a pound from above. It is a creative combo, but not worth much in the face of Geodude's hard exterior, with the boulder retaliating with a mega punch to the chin that sends Trico flying. This is Ash battling though, and so even in the face of this setback, he is able to find a way to turn it to his advantage, having Trico use the momentum of its inevitable fall to empower a second pound attack. This does quite a bit more damage, with Roxanne getting serious and calling for a rock throw, but as the shards of stone fly at Trico, it is easily able to bat them aside with its tail, having gotten in plenty of impromptu training thanks to Bayleaf's grudge, thus making it stronger than in canon. This allows the grass gecko to close the gap and deliver one more pound, much to the surprise of Geodude, and as it goes crashing into the rocky battlefield this time, it does not get back up. Roxanne's second and final Pokemon is Nose Pass, and though Ash feels confident that Trico can go all the way, this hope is proved to be a vain one when Roxanne calls for a Rock Tomb. At once, a pyramid of stones form around Trico's body, catching her off guard and crushing it. Though Ash calls for a pound to escape, there isn't enough free space for Trico to swing its tail, and so after a moment of struggle, the grass type's eyes become spirals. Returning Trico with his thanks, Ash brings out his final Pokemon, Totodile, with the little croc doing a happy dance at being chosen to battle. Giving the water type an appraising look, Roxanne comments that it is certainly spirited, though they will have to see if its battling prowess can match up to its eagerness. In turn, Ash grins, then adopting a serious tone calls for Totodile to use Water Gun. At once, the pressurized jet of water shoots forth from Totodile's mouth and since Nose Pass is a slow creature, it can do little to resist the super effective deluge. Even still, it is sold as a rock, and so stands its ground, launching a rock tomb which traps Totodile, just as it did Trico. At once, Totodile begins to thrash under the crushing weight, but Ash thankfully stays calm, telling Totodile that it can get out of this. Trusting its trainer, Totodile listens as Ash details his plan, and when he is done, the water croc burbles its name before setting to its work biting down on the stone around its neck. Curiously, Roxanne asks what it's doing, but Ash explains that according to his previous Pokédex, Totodile's jaws can crush anything, so he's putting that claim to the test. And Totodile does not disappoint, as with a fierce crack, the front side of the rock tomb crumbles, allowing the bitey gator to scramble to freedom and fire off another water gun which strikes true like the previous one. By now, Nose Pass is in a sorry state, having taken two super effective moves, forcing Roxanne to call for a trump card, Zap Cannon. At once, an orb of electrical energy forms on the tip of Nose Pass's compass nose, but before Roxanne can fire it, Ash puts all his hopes into one last water gun. As soon as this makes contact with the Zap Cannon, pandemonium breaks loose, as the stream of water acts as a conductor, bathing Nose Pass in electrified water, but also giving the current a direct path back into Totodile's mouth. Both Pokemon are blasted onto their backs by the force of this, though only one finds the strength to rise once again, and it is... Totodile. Ash is beside himself, hugging Totodile and even joining it in Pikachu for a celebratory dance before Roxanne comes over to present him with a stone badge. Like with Norman, she commends the boy for his skill as a Pokemon trainer, and in turn, Ash thanks her for a great battle. He then places his new badge into its case and smiles. Two down, six to go. And that's where we'll leave things. What challenges await Ash in his remaining Hoenn gym battles? Which Pokemon will he choose for his upcoming match on Jufit Island? And will the addition of his older Pokemon allow him to go further than he did in canon? Find out as the journey continues.